I can see more screens now. So if you would like to raise your hand, that would also work. Or feel free to type in the chat as well to everyone. Um, and of course, you can do that throughout the session. Um, yeah, just give it a few more moments if someone wants to unmute um, or we can move on as well. Hi. All right. My yeah. name is Prasad Jaradi and I'm trying to share my um, room's uh, experience. Uh, I met a uh, few people who are passionate about the ocean and uh, living uh, surrounding the oceans. And they, at the same time, they're also concerned about the issues uh, uh, that are happening with the uh, ocean, including fishing, etc. So um, I started bragging about my experience uh, from my childhood. And I also um, bragged about the work that I am doing uh, through uh, organic engines to um, rejuvenate coral reefs and mangroves and also um, treating the oil spills into the ocean. And I have invited my group to join hands to collectively work together to save the ocean health. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thanks for sharing. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's good to hear some like lively discussions in the breakout rooms. So yeah, today um, I'm going to introduce our topic and a case study. So over 3 billion people globally depend on seafood as their primary source of protein. And unfortunately, roughly 30%. So unsustainable fisheries and farms dominate the global seafood trade, resulting in unrelenting marine uh, ecosystem degradation and many sustainable seafood products lack market access. So yeah, today's topic is mostly on overfishing and the ocean-wise seafood label is synonymous with sustainable seafood choice. So with 15 years of experience in the sustainable seafood place and an existing network of nearly 800 unique partners across the supply chain in Canada and 10 other countries, OceanWise has a strong and trusted reputation for influencing business and consumer purchasing. So we're going to have our first speaker today. I'll have Dab me introduce Sofika. Great. Um, yeah, so we are um, joined today by the um, Director of Fisheries and Seafood, Sofika um, Kostinyuk. So Sofika is the Director of Fisheries and Seafood at OceanWise in the Seafood Program, which has been guiding the seafood industry and consumers to choose sustainably harvest seafood since 2005. The Fisheries and Seafood Program is focused on growing into new geographies and to, into diving small scale fisheries and salmon habitat work to create and direct positive impacts on the water. Sofika is deeply committed to building diverse networks of passionate individuals who share a collective vision of the world in which they want to live. With nearly 20 years of experience leading environmental and social justice campaigns throughout the US and Canada, Sofika crafted California's organic seafood labeling bill, SB 730, shaped supply chain transformation in the forest sector with Canopy Planet and secured legislative reform on environmental rights while at the David Suzuki Foundation. Sofika feels a great sense of urgency to turn the tide on sustainable fishing practices and is, is, and is convinced that humor and humility are essential components to any transformation. So um, now Sofika, um, you can share your screen. Awesome, we can see everything. Fantastic, should I just take it away from here? Yes, please do so. 
Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for the, uh, the very generous and warm welcome. I'm thrilled to be joining everyone on the call today. Thank you to the IUCN, Parks Canada, and everybody in the audience for, uh, for taking time out of your busy days to learn a little bit more about uh, the overfishing conundrum that we're currently facing on the planet. Um, this is a space that I dedicate pretty much all of my, my time to these days. And it is fascinating. There's a lot, a lot of promise and there are still a lot of challenges that need to be overcome. Um, this particular image, I thought that I would share it for, uh, for the initial screen sh share um, because it is an actual fishing vessel that is sailing through the very, uh, very wild and unpredictable North Sea in search of seafood. Um, so the risks are extraordinary. I was just saying a little while ago, you couldn't pay me enough to, uh, to be on that vessel, but the rewards are extraordinary sometimes in the marketplace. So people and various actors do take these risks um, to, to profit from seafood. Going to advance my screen. Here we go. Um, not an unfamiliar image to anybody, of course. When we uh, look at our beautiful blue planet from space, it's still, for me, a lot of the time, kind of takes my breath away and, and makes me pause and think about the enormity of the oceans. And in fact, it's one single ocean surrounding all of the all of the land masses on our planet so the water circulates the fish move through it tides flow um, 2.8 billion people live in coastal communities so are deeply deeply connected every single day to to the health of those coastlines and uh, often live and work near and on the ocean um, the the Oceans cover around 71% of our planet's surface. They possess some of the most extraordinary land formations on Earth, the deepest trenches, the largest mountain chains, and they're still extraordinarily mysterious. Even to this day, we know much more about outer space than we do about the oceans and what they contain. But despite this vastness, um, humanity, humans, people, we have managed to very negatively impact the ocean, certainly in the last 50 to 60 years. Um, and in order for us to begin turning the tide on the problems that we've created, we have to spend time and think about what those problems are and what the trajectories are if we don't change our ways but also what are the solutions that are out there? Some simple, some complex. Um, how, do we, how do we repair the problems that we have created? So just a little bit of a trip back in time uh, to, uh, to my youth. <laughs> this is me uh, in the days when I actually had a six pack um, <laughs> playing in the ocean with my brother and my father. This is kind of late 70s, early 80s. And this is really how I spent a whole lot of time in the summers. My parents were both high school teachers. My father was a math teacher and my mother taught geography and French. But, whoa, were we ever ready for adventure? The day after school finished, we would pack up our, uh, our camper van and really just explore the wilds and the coastlines of North America. And this is, this is really how I spent so many of my days, snorkeling in the water, swimming, boogie boarding, body surfing. It was pretty darn idyllic. Um, so, so yeah, I would say the water and, and the oceans were sort of bred into me as something that, um, that I was very much connected to and that, that I derived a lot of pleasure from. So life was very different back then. I mean, it was 40 or so years ago. The global population was sitting around four and a half billion people as opposed to the 7.8 billion people that currently inhabit the planet. Mount St. Helens, if you ever heard about that, erupted at that time. Post-it notes were invented, transformed, transformed the office space forever. 
Um, but also atmospheric carbon was at around 335 parts per million as compared to 414 or so parts per million today. Lots has changed in a very short time, um, time span. So fast forward around 40 years or so, um, I had the, the privilege of traveling to Japan a few summers ago to Toyosu Fish Market, which is the largest, if not um, second largest fish market on the planet. We arrived around seven o'clock in the morning, and this is the photo to the left, at the tail end of the daily tuna auction. And I was absolutely struck, uh, struck by the magnitude of this facility. This is a tiny little snippet of um, the huge floor space that, that was set aside every single day for, for tuna auctioning. And this just really impacted me so much. It was, it was probably a few football fields of, um, of space that had been covered by tuna earlier that morning. Um, to the right is, of course, not an unfamiliar image, again, um, of fish being captured. This is a purse seine that's really just a big net that cinches up at the top and uh, hauls, the, hauls the fish up onto the deck of the boat for, for processing. What is overfishing? And most simply put, overfishing is pulling too many fish out of the sea where the breeding population cannot recover adequately. That's all it is. The ocean is the last wild frontier, and we know that increased fishing pressure um, drives this very nearsighted approach, and, and it just can't be sustained. As a result, um, Overfishing is very often quoted as one of the greatest threats facing our oceans today, of course, with climate change and other types of pollutions, pollution, um, but likely around a third of the world's fish stocks are overfished. 49% specific to Canada of the major fish stocks um, are considered healthy which leaves the remaining 51% as in question. Um, lots of concerns around illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries. The interesting thing is, um, and this statistic always makes my jaw drop, is that um, the, the appetite for fish is skyrocketing. So um, in 2019, the most recent statistic was showing that on average, every person on the planet was consuming over 20 kilograms, 20 kilograms of fish per year. To me, that is staggering. Um, and it's, it's also really reflective of the different preferences, the, the cultural connections, the dependencies that different parts of the world have on fisheries. I don't think this number is nearly as high in Canada, um, but it's just something um, that's, that's amazing to me. The other interesting piece is that aquaculture, far less so talked about, um, and when we hear the term aquaculture, we often think shrimp farming and salmon farming, but aquaculture is very diverse and super prolific around the planet, currently makes up over 50% of all the fish consumed and produced on the planet. The demand for this type of, um, of lean protein is continuing to escalate. And so we really have to be a lot smarter about the way that we produce, uh, consume and harvest seafood. Now, what are, what are the problems with overfishing? Why does it actually matter? Well, overfishing produces all of these cascading effects. As we know, with, you know, without any doubt, nothing exists in a vacuum. If you impact a certain part of an ecosystem, there are ripple effects throughout the rest of the ecosystem. Um, things, things happen from, from various types of gear, like these purse seines that are, that are depicted on the screen, 
bottom trawls, um, the impact habitat, the impact other species producing bycatch. Um, they, there are often social justice issues associated with these very large scale operations that operate in very remote places around the planet where there is no oversight, regulatory oversight. Um, we have to be super mindful about the way that we remove species uh, from the ocean if we're choosing to eat seafood at all. So how much fish is coming out of the ocean on an annual basis? Well, nobody actually knows with pinpoint accuracy. And the reason is because of that big segment, the IUU, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing that's going on, that part of the fishing industry makes up approximately 30% of all seafood that's coming out of the ocean. Um, and by weight, it's estimated. So if you think of every single person in Canada, combine their weight, multiply that by nine. So this is a very large number. That's how much um, is being estimated of fish that's coming out of the water that is unreported and illegally caught. So something, something must change because we see images like this on the right far too often. This is a sad, sad depiction of bycatch from a shrimp fishery. So it was getting trawled. We see all kinds of bycatch, anything from prawns to scallops to, of course, the, the shark and everything else, which is heartbreaking. How on earth did we get here? Well, we actually got to this place not that long ago. Um, people have been fishing sustainably on the planet since we've been walking, um, you know, and anyone that was living near a coastline or on a river, on a lake where there was fish present, that was a source of food and it was sustainable. It was local. Um, it was small scale artisanal, we now call this. It was very targeted. So one species would be pulled out with you know, a net or a harpoon or a hook, whatever it was. This has gone on for tens of thousands of years. Aquaculture, uh, so the farming of fish and seafood has also gone on sustainably for well over 3000 years. Many documented cases of small scale farms Usually uh, vegetarian species, things like carp and tilapia, other, other species like that, that people were growing in ponds uh, in their villages and close by to their homes. Again, very sustainable, small scale, really um, very, very little impact. So where did things begin to shift? Well, in the 1950s with um, the invention of new technologies, fishing ships, fishing boats started to get a lot bigger, a lot more technologically advanced. And we see the, uh, the contrast here between the picture on the, top left, on the top right versus the one on the bottom right. Top right is sort of a standard fishing boat from the 1950s, probably going out for a day trip. Bottom right, this is a big <laughs> trawler that set sail out of Germany in 2018. This type of fishing vessel has processing facilities on board. It has deep freezers on board. Um, it can stay out at sea for many, many weeks, if not months at a time. Sometimes these vessels are actually in a network with very large kind of mothership vessels where they deposit their catch on the mothership. That mothership takes it back to shore to, um, to get it into the marketplace. And this vessel along with many others stay out at sea. Um, and this is probably similar to the boat that we saw in the first slide um, that can go into really treacherous, uh, treacherous conditions. So here on the left, between the 1950, uh, 1950s and 2005, it's a heat map of where fishing occurred. Again, 1950s, right along the coastlines, not venturing far out into um, the far reaches of the ocean. By 
2005, because of technology, because of globalization and global um, trade expansion, because of people's expanding palates and interests in new species, we started seeing um, this massive shift in terms of where fishing was happening, what species were getting pulled out of the water, and we saw the populations of fish beginning to decline. So don't lose hope. You know, why do I stay in this work? It's not because I'm hopeless. That's not what wakes me up every morning. It's because change, um, change is coming and change is here. And we need to um, speed up the rate of change. But the world has woken up to the fact that there are significant challenges facing our oceans and that we, as a global population, hold the key to turning the tide. So just a few of the many, many efforts that are underway um, that have received global attention, but also global pickup. The IPCC report, Intergovernmental Plan uh, Panel on Climate Change, put out a sort of staggering report where a few years ago, or last year, I guess, um, announcing that we had 10 years to turn the tide on ocean health. Um, the, the IPCC is basically the voice of many of the top scientists on the planet. Um, they work with marine biologists and many uh, scientists from many, many other fields. The resounding conclusion of their report was, again, we had 10 years, 2030, to turn the tide that um, very ambitious and audacious initiatives needed to get underway to turn the tide and that everyone needed to participate in in these activities to create a difference the united nations development program sdgs sustainability uh, sustainability development goals were also um, a key moment of awakening particularly for industry because it allowed for industry to have this common language and these common goals of the sustainability development goals so that they knew where to point themselves, their targets, and they could speak in this common language. So of course, um, sustainability development goal 14, life below water is most applicable to the to the work that I do and my team does and OceanWise focuses on, but there are many other SDGs that are also really, really important um, for us not to lose sight of and to bring into our efforts every day. For example, SDG 1, which is no poverty, SDG 2, zero hunger, SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. Over 60 million people globally are directly employed in the fishing industry. So it's really important to give people good quality and safe work. Um, and lastly, SDG 13, of course, climate action. Third, we have here Rise Up. Um, this is a loop, uh, a group that leverages the SDG framework and the SDG system. They are calling for global action. Uh, between civil society, fisher people, um, indigenous people, philanthropic organizations, governments, corporations, to jointly agree to bold action to safeguard the oceans. So we see these kind of cascading uh, efforts rising up out of the uh, SDGs and the United Nations leadership in this space. And ocean-wise, of course, we have also built our own conservation strategy that's pointed at 2030 to change the tide on some very specific efforts. We have seven initiatives that we are all committed to that our board is, uh, is supporting and championing us um, making progress in this space. We're so thrilled um, because we know that young people, everyone has a role to play, but young people in particular are getting very involved. They're very vocal. Um, young people are who really put sort of the climate conversation and crisis on the map. Um, young people are showing up on the covers of Time Magazine uh, because of their activism. 
Um, and it's just, you know, th this is the world that you've largely inherited. So I think that the sense of urgency is so much more uh, evident and, uh, and, and pertinent, I guess, to, uh, to your world than it might be to older generations that have maybe had a bit of an easier go of it. Um, in the past. And I will tell you, I have an 11 year old daughter um, who is very highly attuned to what is happening globally. She holds me to task. So that is, uh, that is what is burning the fire under my behind to do the very best that I can every day. A few other places where OceanWise is uh, very intentionally showing up is in a collaborative global solution space. So there are two global bodies that we belong to. One is the Global Seafood Ratings Alliance, a group of 14 organizations from places like Japan, China, um, Australia, the Netherlands. We have a group there from Brazil and Costa Rica. We all work collectively together on the same goals. We might appear differently in the public space and in the marketplace with different labels or logos, but we are all working towards um, a place where the ocean is healthy and thriving into the future, which means no destructive, no illegal fishing practices. That is unacceptable. Um, there's also the the uh, Conservation Alliance for Seafood Solutions. This global body is now comprised of around 43 member groups, anything from aquariums to stakeholder groups to some in the industry, some in the supply chain, organizations like ourselves. And we work collectively to accelerate our, our leverage and accelerate our action to ensure that fishing practices are sustainable, that the supply chain and consumers are preferentially sourcing sustainable seafood. So what is OceanWise's definition of sustainable seafood? Um, we have three primary criteria that, um, that we look at to ensure that stocks are healthy. So they're healthy and resilient, um, and can withstand fishing pressures. There are effective and adaptive management practices, and there's limited impact on habitat and other species. We work throughout the entire supply chain. So starting with primary producers, so fishermen, uh, aquaculture operators, we work with suppliers, distributors, moving through to restaurants, retailers, and then ultimately to the consumers, whether they be shopping in grocery stores or um, eating at their favorite restaurants. We provide a lot of um, content, easy to use tools, and it really is just a system of on and off. So yes, something is recommended, in which case it receives the logo and the acknowledgement that it is sustainable from an ecological perspective, or no, it's not, and there will be an absence of a logo. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff that we do in, in a you know, non-COVID world <laughs> um, with many of our program partners, and, and we enjoy partnerships with over 750 unique businesses. We show up in 11 different countries actually around the world. Um, so we primarily work in Canada in the U.S., on engagement, uh, which can show up in the form of things like a chowder chow down competition, uh, in-person tastings, engagements. Um, we offer a lot of education to our program partners. We offer public webinars. Um, there's something that we're very enthusiastic about pushing a lot more in the coming years. And this year is sort of the year that we're getting into this space is thinking about restorative and ocean positive species. Those that actually contribute back into the environment where they are farmed. Things like kelp and seaweed, uh, mussels, oysters, any kind of shellfish, really they're filtering the water where they're grown and uh, producing a healthier ocean environment where, um, where they exist. 
Something that we're quite enthusiastic about this June and July, though we're still operating in a virtual environment, because we have um, around 3,000 physical locations of our business partners, um, a wave Waves of Change campaign. And this is the campaign to end overfishing. We are calling on our business partners to be bold, to make public commitments in terms of what species they will be removing from their inventories and replacing them with sustainable uh, seafood offerings. Um, we're calling on them to host fundraisers and we're calling on them to amplify the messaging that overfishing is not acceptable. So stay tuned for that. We're hoping that there is going to be a lot of pickup. We already have many of our major program partners signing up for this campaign, but this is what we need is those, um, those ripple effects and we need our businesses to also be leading the way. Very quickly, two, um, two initiatives that we are embarking on that are new to OceanWise. One is beginning to work with small scale fisheries. So we have just received some seed funding from the Canadian federal government to partner with our Arctic program at OceanWise and our Arctic partners up in Nunavut to look at small scale Inuit fisheries and bring them into the fold of sustainable uh, fisheries ratings and recommendations to give them the profile that they have lacked in the past. Uh, we just held our kickoff meeting with our program partners yesterday, really, really enthusiastic about learning from our partners in the North and co-creating this um, new sort of micro economy that we believe will will benefit them will ensure that um, they are able to continue fishing sustainably in traditional uh, traditional areas as well with traditional methods and just sort of celebrating the fact that um, many people are are really harvesting fish in a, in a sustainable way and can support their communities we're also embarking on a salmon initiative that's focusing on um, climate change and the impacts of climate change on Pacific salmon species. So this will be a multi-year project where we'll be mapping out the areas where waters look like they will stay the coldest. Salmon require cold water refuges to, um, to survive and to thrive. Once that mapping phase is complete, then um, we'll be partnering with a number of organizations that are experts in restoration and conservation efforts to ensure that um, we're able to provide that data and guidance and they're able to actually undertake the restoration efforts that are required to, um, to give Pacific salmon a chance to thrive again on, uh, on the Pacific coast. With that, I'll wrap up and thank everyone again for, um, for listening in, for, uh, for the support and interest of the IUCN and, uh, and all of you today. Just let's remember nature is indeed resilient. If we give nature the chance to rebound, um, we will be ensuring that, that we too can enjoy a, um, a healthy and, uh, and prosperous future. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Sofika. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, yeah, learned so much. And I especially liked that like picture with the tuna. Um, yeah, so now we have a Q&A session. I already see a lot of um, comments in the chat. So, oh. okay, I'll just scroll to the first one. There's a lot of them actually. Okay. Um, so Will Harris asked, is there a source material for the statistics? So I think he was referring to one of the earlier slides or actually Will, are you able to unmute and then ask directly? 
Yeah, hi. It was um, the slides earlier one uh, earlier on about um, how much was actually unsustainable and like the statistics in Canada. I think it was like a grid on the right side of the slide. I was just wondering if there's any like source material I could maybe do some extra reading into. Yeah, absolutely. So um, shall I stop sharing my screen? Just a quick mm -hmm. question. Yeah, okay. Um, so everything that OceanWise puts out into the world is based in science. Um, always, I would say, peer reviewed published science. So that's where all of our recommendations come from. Um, much of our data in Canada is obtained through the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, DFO. Um, so that's one place where you could find, you know, a lot of the information that you're looking for. Oceana um, publishes annual fishery audits. That's another place where you can start um, digging into the details of the various fisheries. I think they have over 200, maybe 215 or so fisheries now that they audit on an annual basis, um, looking at stock levels, at harvest methods, at locations, and the trends. So you can, you can find a lot of the data there. If there's anything super specific that, that you're looking for, um, please just send me a note afterwards and I can follow up with an email and a link. That's brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Awesome, yeah, thanks for answering that. So Anna asks, Sofika, do you recommend the Seaspiracy documentary? <laughs> sure, I mean, I, <laughs> I watched it. Um, we had a viewing party with the fisheries and seafood team. I admittedly did cry um, twice, uh, mostly at the very, the very end scene, which is depicting one of the most traditional kind of sustainable fisheries on the planet. But it's very, it's a very visually emotive um, documentary. So I encourage people to watch it. Of course, because it does present the most problematic aspects of overfishing, which is the illegal side of fishing, um, the social justice problems, slave labor, um, habitat destruction and bycatch. Primarily, those are, are the main themes. So that is everything that OceanWise, um, all of our partners in the Conservation Alliance for Seafood Solutions, the Global Seafood Ratings Alliance, that is everything that we're working to um, negating and to ensuring that that type of fishing does not continue because it, it is highly destructive, highly problematic, super short-sighted, um, and it just, it's, it, it should not be allowed. Um, so yes, I, I would encourage you to watch it. It'll definitely spark a lot of uh, conversations, I'm sure, and a lot of questions. But I would also say that so much of the other side of the story uh, is not presented. Um, the fact that, you know, around 3 billion people every day rely on seafood as a very important source of protein, that's not presented. So the different geographical um, contexts are sort of excluded from the film. Um, and that's where I would encourage people to spend a bit more space, uh, space and time, just kind of expanding your knowledge around the, the full context of what happens in fisheries, because there is a lot of good that happens in fisheries. A lot of fisheries actually are rebounding from uh, areas where they have been overfished. So the National Atmospheric and uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, every quarter year, they publish a list of fisheries that have rebounded from overfishing. Um, and it's, it's very encouraging, and that's just for the U.S. alone. So we know that if fisheries are properly managed, they can sustain local economies, they can sustain themselves, they can rebound, um, and that's sort of the solution path moving forward. Great. Um... Yeah, it's good to hear since that's like a very popular documentary right now. 
Top um, 10. <laughs> yeah. So Ronan asks, um, is this relating to the 30x30 movement? So um, maybe Ronan, you can unmute and ask exactly which part you're referring to. Yeah, so there was a slide you showed, I think, when you were talking about the SDG uh, and the um, IPCC, and it said something about, I think, was restoring. To, uh, I might be losing you or it might be on my end. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I also can't hear you, so it, it's probably. Um... Sorry, was that? Did you say oh, something? There we go. Did my sound cut out? Yes, it did. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll start over there. So, on one of on the slide when you were talking about the SDG, uh, uh, and the IPCC talking about restoring the seafood, I believe by 2030, I was wondering if that was also part of the a United Nations organization, 20 by 30, sorry, 30 by 30 movement, which is a global type of movement to restore 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. So I was just curious if that was relating or not. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I like the way that your, your mind is working sort of in a systems approach, like what is the whole ecosystem? It's not directly related to it, but um, it, it sort of supports um, the 30 by 30 movement. Um, and I think, yeah, I think 2030 is just such a clear cutoff date that it's very easy for a variety of government bodies as well as, you know, corporations, nonprofit organizations, stakeholders to point themselves to because it is a very sharp deadline. Um, we have to start seeing positive change occur by 2030 or else we know what's on the other side of that line. So I would say loosely, yes. Um, are they, you know, are they complementary? Yes. Is it the same thing? Not, not exactly. Awesome. Thanks, Sophika. Um, yeah, so then Friederike asked, what are the criteria OceanWise is using to determine what is a sustainable fishery? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's in one of the slides, although it's, I just lightly touched on it. Um, the reports that are produced for each one of our fisheries assessments, they're, it'll put you to sleep. So, you know, around 120, 150 pages, <laughs> totally um, transparent, publicly available information. You can find any of the reports that you like on our website at any point in time. So you just go to seafood.ocean.org and then you can start searching for whatever seafood you're interested in um, and then click on the science reports. But to distill it down to a few sound bites, it really is those three main criteria. So we're only looking at ecological impacts at present. So one is the stock healthy and abundant and resilient to fishing pressure. Is it well managed? And those two often go hand in hand. Um, so that's Department of Fisheries and Oceans or NOAA or whatever body is overseeing that fishery, ensuring that, you know, the quotas are set at appropriate levels, that there's coverage and data collection and analysis and sort of a responsive approach to managing it. So that's kind of one bundle. Two is that there, uh, there are minimal impacts to habitat. So minimal habitat destruction and minimal bycatch and impact to other species. That's great, yeah. And um, we have the website in the chat as well, so we can visit this. Um, I think the last question in the chat where I think um, 
Well, we'll go with like someone different. So Gianluca asks, how can we reverse the trend when human population is growing, but meat and fish demand is also increasing? Absolutely, that, that is the question of our time. So as our population increases globally, we are putting pressure on every system that's out there. So land-based agriculture is no different. You know, access and abundance of fresh water, no difference. Um, you know, are we polluting our soil, our air, no different. For um, seafood, so remember earlier on, I was saying that aquaculture has actually, far, farming sea, uh, seafood and fish has actually overtaken the production of wild fisheries um, in the last probably five, five to eight years. That trend I'm anticipating will continue. And this to me is really exciting. So I'm not saying farm things like tuna or salmon or the big species that require a lot of resources to grow the fish. Let's think about a really smart way of pursuing um, seafood farming. So it could be seaweed farming, where we're contributing positively back into the environment. Let's think about sort of smaller scale farms that are maybe land-based and you're raising um, vegetarian species. So things like tilapia and so on that don't require other fish for food to grow. Um, and let's, you know, let's let's keep it local. Let's keep the, the production closer at hand so we don't have to move all that product around the planet and increase our carbon footprint. So, so to me, that's kind of the, um, the golden egg. This is what we're chasing, is just being a lot smarter about our food production, whether it's, you know, seafood or dairy or soy or nuts or whatever it is. Everything has an impact. How do we minimize the impact of, um, of the production, recognizing that the scale is going to have to increase as population numbers increase? Yeah, that's great. And I've like definitely heard about too, like aquaculture and having tilapia for like food banks. And so that it's not just like nice. cereals there. Um, great. So, uh, before we go on break, were there any other questions? Naria or Naria? Yes. That you had it right first time, Naria. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Naria Gorder. I live in New Jersey. I don't work in the fishing industry, but I've actually had experience. Um, I, I helped my husband with um, ocean and boating education for young people. Um, so we've worked with like a lot of different captains and environmentalists and things like that to create um, education materials and programs. But um, so that's quick background. But I have a lot of questions, I guess, um, just from what I've seen and heard from friends who are also working in the fishing industry. But um, I've also worked in Kodiak, Alaska. They have um, a major salmon fisheries uh, like there in that area and it's like uh, of Alaska and the Bering Sea and also West Coast. And in Kodiak, they have a salmon hatchery um, that plays a really major role in the production of salmon. Basically, they hatch baby salmon and send them into like on um, the freshwater streams and then when they're big enough they head into the ocean and because of that um, those salmon fishermen have enough salmon um, to support themselves. Um, if that kind of model was created for other fish as well would that be um, like a good way to go or do you see there might be some kind of implications um, with like other species or just having that kind of a system in order to produce more fish for a growing population? Yeah, um, super, super fascinating that you were able to be up in Alaska to sort of witness the scale of their hatchery, hatchery program for salmon. Um, it is one of the most abundant salmon fisheries on the planet, but really it's because it is so heavily supplemented with that hatchery, hatchery system. Um, I'd say that it's, and I'm not an authority in this space, um, but you know, it, it is solving a lot of the issues um, that 
you know, other, other locations have been experiencing with declining salmon populations. So I think hatcheries can play um, part of the solution or can play a role in part of the solution. There are questions that come about in scenarios like that um, in terms of genetic diversity and biodiversity because you're, you're just typically raising one or two different species of, um, of salmon as opposed to all of the native salmon species that used to inhabit those waters. So there's kind of um, a lessening of biodiversity. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it can play part of the part, part of the solution. It can be part of it. Um, for other species, I don't know enough about hatchery programs and if that would even be feasible. Um, it just depends on the biological demands of, uh, of every specific species, but salmon are particularly well suited, I guess, for hatchery, hatchery breeding. Thank you. I have more questions, but I don't know if anyone else has. Um, okay, yeah, if anyone else had questions. Um, yeah, if I may follow up uh, my previous question. Yeah, um, yes. I was wondering, we, uh, we talked ex extensively about uh, the supply side of fisheries, but um, coming back to my question as regards the growing human population and the fish demand, can't we also act uh, on the demand side? I mean, convincing people to reduce their consumption. Well, certainly some, um, some groups are doing that. And of course, that's, that's kind of the main call to action of films like Seaspiracy. So choosing a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet can also be part of the solution. Um, we at OceanWise, entirely support people's individual choices. What you decide to put in your body is up to you. Um, we do also have to recognize that there are so many cultural differences across the planet. Um, traditional, you know, dependencies on fisheries, the importance that fish play in many cultures, um, that's not something that, you know, is up to me to decide uh, for, for, you know, or to say, you know, you're from this part of the world, or this is your cultural background or your religious background that you should choose to do something differently. That is not my place. So where OceanWise shows up is if people choose to eat seafood, these are the types of seafood that are um, recommended from a sustainability perspective. So we know through the science that's conducted, that's peer reviewed and published, that those populations will continue to be able to sustain themselves and um, continue to provide sustenance and employment for people uh, involved in, you know, either in that sector or consuming them. Awesome, thank you. And so then Gilbert would like to offer some thoughts. And I realize that there's a lot more questions in the chat, um, but Sofika's email is in her background. I can also put it in the chat. Um, if you're okay with that, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and we were saying maybe through the um, through the Hova app, we could also post some of the questions for follow up down the line. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so I'll let Gilbert talk uh, since I don't think he's asked a question before, and then after uh, we will do the body break. Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to speak briefly. So my name is Gilbert Castellanos. I work for the United States Department of the Interior. I'm the head of delegation to one of the Arctic Council working groups. I am a foreign affairs specialist. And uh, I also engage on youth engagement. It's an important part of the United States work in the Arctic Council. 
the, the, the topic of the discussion here today, it's been wide ranging. It's been really interesting to me. I know I've heard examples of where, um, I, oh, sorry. And I happen to be in Anchorage, Alaska. I represent US interests on Arctic international issues. And so um, we heard a little bit about salmon and there's definitely issues on aquaculture. There's a lot to be very uh, mindful of in, in terms of potential for disease potential for introduction of invasive species, and in many cases, potentially causing greater harm than helping. And I think in any action that we take with respect to ocean conservation, protection, or fisheries more broadly, we need to be careful with that. I just wanted to mention quickly about the, the question of, of, of um, choices that people make about what to eat and how to eat. There are very effective, and in some cases, people have said in terms of reducing poverty and reducing hunger around the world, uh, freshwater aquaculture, in particular tilapia, catfish, there are certain species which have high energy content, are healthy, and can be sustainably grown in an aquaculture scenario, but there are cautions that we need to take. So I just wanted to add a little bit to that. The other thing I wanted to say, which is something that I think is a big topic of the discussion today is, okay, how can you make a difference? How can you get engaged? And that's where I wanted to just offer one or two quick thoughts. There are many, many, many youth summits, youth programs, some of which I helped to facilitate. For example, we had a global Arctic youth summit that was hosted in Rovaniemi, Finland in 2020, in 2018. And our plan is to have another global Arctic youth summit in Russia as part of their Arctic Council chairmanship in 2022. We have a number of different youth engagement activities, but I think what, what, what would be awesome is to harness the power and energy of a youth group like this to begin to engage in those kinds of youth activities that are out there and harness and really uh, uh, find synergy, leverage those opportunities to set up your own, let's say, pick up plastic waste along the coast or on Earth Day, um, engage with those other youth activities and implement new outreach and communication tools. We found how effective um, social media can be, right? Putting together a TikTok on the plastic problem in the ocean, just continuing to make sure that you're sharing what are the problems and how can you solve them. And I think that um, youth have such a powerful voice. You, I can be in a meeting of international diplomatic, you know, senior people, foreign ministers, and you're sitting at the meeting and everybody's talking and everyone's, you know, typing on their cell phone, kept sending out messages. But if a youth comes up and starts talking, you can drop a pin everyone pays attention. What does this person have to say? I hope you'll appreciate how powerful you are, how strong your voice is, and more importantly, how important it is for you to engage in these issues. Those small things like your own decision to think carefully about whether to eat the tuna or eat the salmon, to ask at the restaurant, where is this fish come from? Do you know if it's caught by long line, by trawling, or is it pole caught? Certain uh, restaurants which are uh, chains in the United States and Canada and elsewhere will will say we are a sustainable, uh, sustainably sourced restaurant. Our fish come from sustainably sourced resource uh, places or, or, or mechanisms, and we should look for that. We should take advantage of that. But you do have a powerful voice. I encourage you to use it. And I'm so uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak and to to participate in this session. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just I'll echo what Gilbert um, was just sharing, and thank you so much for uh, for bringing that to the conversation, Gilbert. It's a hundred percent true. Uh, youth voices matter. Your genuine, you know, passion flows through when you bring issues um, to decision makers, whether it be in a grocery store or you know a represented. Um, uh, elected representative. So speak up, ask the questions, ask the questions in restaurants. Um, as Gilbert said, you know, where, where is this fish coming from? If the answers aren't there, my rule of thumb is I'm not going to, I'm not going to assume that it's sustainable. I'm going to assume it's unsustainable, but the tools are out there for reference guides. There's so much information um, that's publicly available. There's so much discussion in uh, social media, um, on social media, just trust, um, make sure that you find sources and resources that you can trust that are, you know, re reviewed and, um, respected, I guess, because there's a lot of information out there. So trust the information source and then, uh, yeah, ask, ask the questions. Awesome, yeah, 
So that was uh, great. So many Q&A and um, yeah, so we're going to have a five minute break right now. So I will see you all at 325 where we'll have a reflection activity and then Mirella will speak. Thank you so much, Sofika. Well, thank you. It was my absolute pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, and I do see Eek4445 uh, comments in the chat. So I'll, I'll start looking through that. And uh, I really hope Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Alrighty, um, let's get started on our next activity. Um, we will be going back into breakout rooms for a short reflection on the present on Sofika's um, presentation, and we went a bit over time in um, in the Q and A. So we will make the the breakout room a bit short, um, and I will post the questions in the chat, and then we will come back and. Um, I guess, depending on time, we'll decide whether or not we have time for a share back. Um, and then we have another short presentation. So here are the questions in the chat. Um, so if you can copy them here before you are put into the breakout room, um, that way you have them because they don't, um, they don't show up in the breakout room. It's an entirely new chat when we sent you when we send you so um, yeah, so feel free to use these questions as a way to start the conversation, or if you want to continue talking more about kind of specific questions that were asked or posed in, um, in response to Sophika's presentation, that works as well. Um, and then we'll see you back here shortly. So I guess like let's start now um, with a share back and then as people join if they want to um, also share back that's great. Um, we just have about time for one or two people to share back about the breakout room. Um, does someone want to go first feel free to raise your hand or just unmute um, and then we'll move on to our next presenter. Okay, I think most everyone is back now. Um, we just have time for about one or two people to share back how the breakout room went, and then we have another presenter. Okay, I see someone's hand up. Fiorandi, if you would like to unmute. Um, so something that we were talking about in our group was um, 
So we only had time to discuss the first two questions of what are uh, positive and negative choices that we make in our day to day lives that impact um, oceans and waterways. And something that we were kind of discussing towards the end was um, how there are certain conditions that we can control and certain conditions that we can't control. So for example, um, I might be fortunate enough to live in an area where I don't have to buy bottled plastic water bottles to drink out of because my area has good tap water that's safe for um, consuming, consuming and um, that I won't get sick from. But there are also other areas of the world where um, that's not the case. So there are other areas of the world where drinking tap water or drinking any other source, sources of water that isn't bottled plastic water, plastic water bottles um, is dangerous. So that's something that we can't control. It just depends on where we live. Um, so we were kind of just like discussing that how um, it really comes down to also like controlling factors like uh, the example that I just used. Um, but we were just also kind of saying like stemming off of that there are a lot of things that we can control. So for example, we can control our choice of whether to even consume seafood. We, seafood. So we can control the fact of, are we going to eat fish or are we not going to eat fish? Are we going to um, contribute to buying plastic water bottles if we live in an area where we don't need to, or are we going to not contribute to it? So it's just kind of like, uh, these types of practices that you implement into your lives, into your life, has to kind of like be mindful of where you're living, what are the conditions that come along with um, your location. And I think that would just be like a good way to, a good starting point to kind of shape um, positive factors that would contribute uh, towards, um, I guess, sustaining and uh, making sure that the ocean is um, kind of sustained, so. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and Nicola, if you would like to unmute. Great. Yep, can everybody hear me talking right now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so from the top, what we talked about was that what we can do as individuals is, yeah, as was just said, we choose some of the, uh, like for instance, in our family, we chose to have three days a week where we choose to be meat free in our meals. Um, some go vegan, some go vegetarian. I think it's all about trying and then be aware and educated. Um, that's what came out of the group discussions for the positive impact. And the negative side is it's very, very bound in, in culture uh, all over the world to have protein as a part of what you eat. Um, and so it's also, I come from a family where my mom and dad are butchers. Um, it was very hard to get free of that and they still don't understand it. So I also, we also talked about there's a generation um, problem, sort of. Um, but we were also a couple of business um, people with business backgrounds and what is still taught to this day, I've, I graduated with my bachelor in, um, in 2019 and Sarah did in 2020, uh, they still teach about this linear make take waste and I cannot understand they still teach that we should be taught about the circular economy instead and it's slowly coming, I gained experience in it in, my, in the master's program um, but even develop parts of the world with universities and colleges still teach the uh, linear way of looking at stuff, which is wrong. We should try to move past that. Um, yeah. All right, thank you for sharing. Um, Zihan, if you, or um, I think we're gonna move on to our next presentation, but if other people want to share back what they talked about in their breakout room and continue that conversation, please feel free to use the chat and then also the community space, which we have posted the link to um, a few times, but we'll do that again, probably before the end of the presentation. 
Awesome. Yeah. So I will introduce Mirella. So uh, Mirella Lays is the Knowledge Mobilization Coordinator for Ocean Frontier Institute's Future Ocean and Coastal Infrastructures Research Project based at Memorial University in Canada. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Oceanography from Federal University of Parana in Brazil and a Master of Science degree in Geography from Memorial University, uh, where re she received the distinction of uh, the Fellow of the School of Graduate Studies. So her research interests include marine conservation, fisheries sustainability, and uh, marine protected area governance, topics on which she authored peer reviewed publications and outreach material. She has previously worked as a research fellow with the Too Big to Ignore Global Scale Fisheries Research um, and project coordinator for well, her current position. And uh, she's also an Ocean Bridge ambassador with OceanWise. So she advocates for ocean conservation and the sustainability of fisheries to Canadian youth. So Mirella, take it away. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear me and see my screen as well. Perfect. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today as I connect from St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, which is the easternmost point in North America. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present a little bit about my journey from understanding life below water to life above water as a youth navigating through ocean conservation and sustainable fisheries. So I will first dive into the world of life below water as an oceanographer trying to understand some of the main issues with our marine environment in my efforts to protect sea turtles and their habitat. Then I'll emerge to the surface and tell you a bit about my journey as a geographer, understanding small scale fishers perceptions so that we leave no one behind as we strive together for sustainable fisheries. Um, and finally, I will share with you the idea of the fish market mobile app uh, which I created and developed to reconnect fishers to local consumers with support from OceanWise's Ocean Bridge program for Canadian youth. So my journey as an oceanographer started by focusing on life below water, exploring the ocean and the coastal ecosystems. Um, sustainable Development Goal 14 is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. I wanted to play a role in conserving the oceans too. But there are so many threats to our oceans and coasts, uh, many of which we're, we're all aware of, uh, such as overfishing. Uh, and we talked about today how this is one of the major threats facing, facing our oceans today. Habitat destruction, biodiversity loss, marine pollution, unsustainable coastal development. And to top it all off, we have climate change. Um, so I couldn't possibly tackle everything, and especially not on my own. So back in 2010, I started off by focusing on green sea turtle conservation. The green sea turtle is endangered, and it's uh, with one of the major threats being habitat degradation. Sea turtles, like many other marine organisms, depend on seagrass ecosystems as a foraging and nursing ground. Uh, we also depend on seagrass. They contribute to carbon storage and act as ecosystem engineers, that's how we can call them, because they improve water quality and offer coastal protection by stabilizing the marine substrate, so stabilizing the sand and the, and the bottom of the ocean. However, like the sea turtles, seagrass meadows are under threat due to coastal development and also eutrophication, which is the increase of nutrients in the, in the coastal zone. They're also extremely vulnerable to climate change. So if I wanted to conserve sea turtles, I needed to conserve seagrass meadows as well. Through my research, I first documented the changes and the impacts to seagrasses on an estuary in southern Brazil, which is where I studied. Um, then I developed a method which is now used by some consultancy companies in Brazil to identify areas where the seagrass could occur based on the sediment characteristics. So what the bottom look like of the, what the bottom of the ocean look like. 
This allows for mapping of priority areas for the green sea turtle conservation and informing uh, sustainable coastal development. So, however, uh, when I started, to re what I started to realize was that to actually put all the results of my research in conservation into practice and have conservation plans that actually worked and effectively conserve seagrass ecosystems and sea turtles, like other marine life, we needed people as well. We needed their interest, their support, their conservation actions. And that's when I decided that I wanted to understand the people who make a living out of the ocean, the same ocean that I was trying to conserve. So what would be the impacts of my conservation plans to those people? What were some of the things that they were doing that already helped with conservation? And how could we become allies in achieving that same goal together? So as I shifted to study marine social sciences, I was determined to try to find a balance between marine conservation and maintenance of, of coastal livelihoods. Just like I had learned from a small scale fisher that I talked to, and he told me about a group of islands that was being set aside for conservation without any consultation to them. Um, he said, it is beautiful to see that place to preserve nature, but fishers make a living out of nature and there's a need to see both sides. That's when I emerged to the world of life above water, as I'm calling here in this presentation, where I was trying to understand coastal people and fisheries. Sustainable Development Goal Target 14B focuses on providing access for small scale artisanal fishers to marine resources and markets. In doing so, we recognize the importance of small scale fisheries and the role they play in conserving life below water. Small scale fisheries, although small in scale, are really big in numbers actually. They contribute about half of global catches with 90 to 95% of it going towards human consumption. They also employ more than 90% of the 120 million people in fisheries, about half of them are women. Small scale fisheries are not only important for employment, livelihoods and food security, but they also present a potential to address some of the major fisheries governance challenges and help achieve not only SDG 14, which is the one we've been talking about in this presentation series, but also other SDGs. However, in spite of their importance and contribution, small scale fisheries are largely marginalized. That became even more clear to me in 2013 when I learned that a no-take marine protected area uh, had been designated in South Brazil without any public consultation. That meant that the livelihoods of 400 small scale fishers in eight different communities was at stake. They depended on that area for fishing. So marine protected areas are only effective with the support of local people like those fishers who were now being disregarded. I then set out to um, talk to those small scale fishers to try to understand their perceptions of marine conservation, as well as to map out the areas that were important to them. So I was trying to understand what areas were important in terms of uh, in, in, in economic terms, sociocultural terms, and ecological terms. This helped elicit uh, their participation in the process of the MPA implementation, so implementing this new marine protected area and their in, and the inclusion of their values and perceptions towards better governance of that marine protected area and the marine environment around it. Uh, after this study and other work that sustained like, this continued involvement with small scale fishers in the area, they have been allowed to fish in the area and have traditionally relied in this area that they have traditionally relied on uh, for their livelihoods through established fishing agreements. So now going back to SDG 14B, uh, which is all about access to resources and markets for small scale fishers, this study was about ensuring that small scale fishers access, had access to those marine resources. But there was more to be done in terms of ensuring small scale fishers access to markets. Um, so I joined OceanWise as an Ocean Bridge Youth Ambassador last year as part of a team of youth from across Canada engaged in creating and delivering service projects to our communities. And for my community service project, I wanted to use what I had learned throughout this journey that I just presented to you from 
understanding life below water to life above water and the people related to it um, and try to tackle that issue too in relation to fish, small scale fishes access to markets. I was born in Brazil where it was easy to have access to fresh fish just off the boat when going to the beach. Um, when I moved to Newfoundland in Canada seven years ago, I wasn't even allowed to buy fresh fish directly from a fisher. And most of what I found at the supermarket wasn't caught or processed here. It was only in 2015 that regulations have changed, allowing direct sales of fish and seafood um, here in the province of Newfoundland. But there aren't mechanisms in place to facilitate those, those uh, direct sales. Uh, and this is in a context where there's a long and complex fish, complex fish chain, as you can see in, in this slide, um, that has increasingly separated fishers from consumers, leaving them disconnected, uh, not only geographically, but also socially, um, with most of the seafood caught in Newfoundland being actually exported. About 90% of it is exported out of the province to other countries. Um, so I wanted to change that and bring local fishers and consumers together again. That's when I created the Fish Market, which is a mobile app for reconnecting local fishers to consumers in Newfoundland and where fishers can directly sell their catch to local consumers, increasing their revenue while contributing to food sovereignty. And also where consumers can connect with fishers, increasing their access to locally caught seafood while contributing to fishery sustainability. So through a map interface um, in the app, consumers can find local fishers, learn about them from their fishers profiles, and then chat about fish and seafood availability, prices, and anything else that you would talk about um, at, a, at an actual fish market. The app is about creating those channels of communication and trying to bring together fishers and consumers um, through the fish and seafood sales. So since a grant approval from Ocean Bridge earlier this year, I have interviewed 40 key uh, informants and form 10 partnerships. Um, with the census for Ocean Bridge, I've also organized events uh, such as a photography contest and a panel discussion uh, call from hook to fork, a missing link in the fish chain, uh, which received a lot of media attention and got a lot of, um, it was, it worked really well as public outreach. And the app is currently being developed and will be launched soon, actually on April 13 next week during my presentation at a pitch and pick event that is for startup companies here in Newfoundland. Um, so all of this wouldn't have been possible without the support and mentorship from OceanWise through this Ocean Bridge program, which I highly encourage you to look it up and, and try to be part of it because it was really something that um, helped me um, think through this, this idea and put that into action. Um, and I would like to thank our partners and sponsors for this, uh, the Fish Market app and for joining and for you to for joining me today, uh, as I told you about my journey from life below water to life above water and, and what I've been doing uh, with OceanWise as part of Ocean Bridge. So I'll be happy to answer any questions now as well as by email. So yeah, feel free to contact me afterwards as well. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat and I'm not sure if you can read them, but I can also um, just read them. And um, so we have a question that's, is the app available in Spanish for Latin America? And then another kind of similar question is, does the app only work in Newfoundland? Oh, those are really good questions. And it's something that I've been thinking about uh, because I am starting this here in Newfoundland because uh, it's where I am and it's where I first identified this issue actually, as I, was, as I was talking about, it was really hard to have access to local fish and seafood here. But I do see uh, a big opportunity for uh, expanding to other places and maybe other countries as well and uh, to other languages too. So my um, I've been talking to one of the partners is in Brazil as an organization called Olho Peixe that tries to increase access to local fish and seafood in Brazil as well. Um, and I actually been talking to him about the app idea and I do want to expand to 
places in Latin America and have that in Spanish and Portuguese and really try, try to go uh, as far as possible, as far as uh, as I'm able to go so that people can have access to fish and seafood and download the app from the app store um, and yeah, be able to connect to local fishers wherever they are. So yeah, thank you. Great, Do, does anyone else have um, any other questions for Mirella? We can, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand and unmute as well. Awesome. If not, then uh, eight universal or basically the same time as today. So if you're in EST, I guess two to four. PM um, come fisheries. So we'll have X bridge participants. So yeah, otherwise um, the community space uh, uh, link is in the chat and and thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Um, Zihan, you were cutting out a little bit, but the reminder was just that our last session, our last English session is tomorrow at the same time. Um, and the community space is also in the chat if you want to continue to pose questions and um, network with each other as well. But um, yeah, I hope to see you all again tomorrow. Thank you again.